Bitchin' Camaro, an early classic from The Dead Milkmen. That song and their popular live performances propelled the group into punk stardom. And with me now is Rodney Anonymous, or Rodney Amadeus Anonymous, or Rodney... Rodney, what name do you go by now? Oh, I know by Rodney Anonymous. I'm always good about going by Rodney Anonymous. I did stupid things by changing it. No, it's pretty much... Every, everybody knows me uh, as Rodney Anonymous, so it's just... Uh, um, Today's a weird day in Philadelphia because I'm on the front of one of the papers, which is an odd feeling because I came back from work and I had to do all this stuff. And I'm like, this is a very, very strange day. I'm running for mayor against Bill Cosby. You have to live in Philadelphia to understand what's going on here right now. <laughs> Rodney Anonymous is with me on Revenge of the Google 80s Google Rodney Radio. Anonymous, Bill Cosby, and you'll see the, the local Philadelphia Weekly. It's, you know, we're having a strange, another strange week in Philadelphia. Well, we can have that and Jim Whale Wander. How about that? I, I haven't heard from him in a long time, but he was a really nice guy. That was, uh, um, you know, it was, it was interesting for me because I don't know anything about sports. I'm completely sports ignorant. I'm not proud of that. You shouldn't be ignorant of anything, but I don't know. So, like, you know, everybody, well, some of the other people in our organization was like, oh, we're in the Detroit Tigers dugout. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. But Jim, Jim was a super nice guy. I haven't, I haven't, like most super nice people I know, I have no idea what happened to them. So. He was known for being a big fan of punk music. Yeah, he was, which is, I guess, kind of, well, was then kind of unusual in the major leagues. I don't know if it's changed since then. I'm sure, you know, punk music became more commercially acceptable as the years went on. Or what they called, what they called alternative, which I call corporate light, became acceptable. Rodney Amadeus of the Dead Milkmen with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Let's go back from the beginning. How did the Dead Milkmen start up, and uh, how did you get into the band? Oh, um, Joe had uh, was into writing at a very young age, his early teens, and uh, um, which was amazing because where we grew up, nobody knew how to read or write. So he was he seemed to stand out with that, and he began writing these short stories about this punk band that had started in the fifties, I think, in late fifties. They were sort of like a folk band. I forget what they were called then. I think they were like the Deeks Brothers. And then by the sixties, they had become this uh, psychedelic band called the Sunflower Children of God. And at one point, they had morphed into a pop band called the Milkmen. And then in Joe's story, one of the people died. And so they had to be called the Dead Milkmen. So he, um, what he did was he needed to create music to go with the story. Because Joe really liked to flesh everything out back then. He would create board games to go with stories. It's probably the most... And you have to this is like, in you know, high school and junior high, so he's the most fascinating person I knew. So I instantly gravitated towards him. And one day he was like, Yeah, I've got this sort of story I'm writing, and you know, so we can, and, and there'll be, you know, we'll make a board game. And his family uh, were like Stephen Hawkins' family, and that they would create these elaborate board games and they would play them for days and days. And it was just so wonderfully weird that uh, um, the minute I was offered a chance to get involved, I was like, Yeah, I raised my hand, I'm in. So that's, the, um, it was just, again, like a lot of great things at the end. It's a high school joke. It sounds like it was kind of a fun project, Rodney, but when did you figure out that the Dead Milkmen would take off and become strong in the underground music scene? I still haven't figured that out. Um, people hated us when we first started because when we first started, punk was very serious, and people would get up on stage and say these songs like, My Stepdad, I Hate Him! And we were like, oh, okay, good. And then we would come up and sing about Charles Dawson Riley, and... Um, I, I remember people like yelling at us, saying like, people are having fun at a punk rock show. They shouldn't be having, people shouldn't be smiling. So yeah, we're, we've always occupied this unusual outcast niche, and we're pretty happy with that. We, if people actually really liked us and figured what we did, we, we wouldn't know how to handle that. What's really puzzling out of this whole thing is that people did not like a song about Charles Nelson Riley. I mean, come on! Well, it wasn't too much the song, the, the effect of the song. Because I say, at that time, there were no, and, and this is something um, industrial music went through at one point. And then, like today, you have like Caustic and the Gossicles, all these very funny industrial bands. At point, industrial was doing the same thing. It was very serious, and you couldn't get up there and make jokes. And that was just the sort of same, you know, wave that punk was going through. So, yeah, pe people didn't like us for a lot of reasons, I'm sure. Well, there are those two punk extremes, the ones that take themselves very seriously and yeah. the ones that are kind of like, hey, this is fun. I like to do this. I could never understand why anybody would want to do something that wasn't fun. I never, to this day, that kind of goes over my head. Even if you look at stuff like, well, that one, I don't look like they were having fun. I probably didn't know they were having fun, but they were having fun. 
A little bit at least. In your early years, Rodney, you played throughout Philadelphia. So talk about the music scene there in the early to mid 80s. Uh, it's pretty much as it is now, which is pretty messed up. Um, in the early 80s, you had a couple of clubs, and they back then uh, the clubs had acts that were sort of associated with the clubs. So getting to play in the clubs was pretty much impossible. Punk and the whole playing in people's living rooms came out of the fact that we were not allowed to play in clubs. It's the same way now uh, in Philadelphia if you're not a sort of twee, again, what they call alternative act. So if you're not like... Um, you know, Best Coast or Beach Houses, you're not going to get into a club. So if we want to see shows now from interesting bands, we usually have to go this place up on North 9th Street. And it's a club, but, uh, um, yeah, we're not allowed into the nicer places. And it was it was like that then. It was, I mean, extremely like that. And um, the whole punk uh, aesthetic in this town, uh, which was very accepting and very eclectic and had all sorts of weird bands and um, and it was great because you would have a punk band on a bill. Nobody could play anywhere if you weren't a pop band. Um, you so you'd have a punk band on a bill with a rockabilly band, and there'd also be like a pellet on the bill. And it was just this really wonderful scene that existed nowhere else. But uh, um, and it bred lots of great bands. The uh, sad part is that Philly's never really been a music friendly town, which is why I live here. Uh, I couldn't live. I couldn't live in somewhere like Austin that's music friendly. And people, hey, that's a good song you wrote. I, I would just punch him in the face. <laughs> I, uh, I like this town because you know, no matter how it, you know, you can rise really, really high up musically. Not that anybody here ever has since Fabian, but people don't care. And I like a town where people don't care. Well, you did have the Hooters. Yeah, we did, and to open that live aid, causing Bob Geldof to ask, "Who the hell are the Hooters?" Now I shouldn't make fun of them. I understand that they're really nice guys. Like everybody who met them says they're super nice, nice guys. Well, you're not mocking them, Rodney, because that was the line in the Rolling Stone magazine. Bob Geldof actually yeah. said that. Yeah, he actually said, "Who? Yeah, who the hell are the Hooters?" And to me, that's you know, I'd be so proud of that. He, if Bob Geldof, didn't know who your band is. If a, if a rock star doesn't know who you are, that's the only problem. If people know who you are, you're getting Grammys and stuff, you're doing something wrong. So we've managed to fly under the radar for so many years. We've been at this for like 30 years, and people still don't know who we are. I consider that a mark of success. Well, not being from New York, Detroit, or L.A., how hard was it to get yourselves noticed outside of Rocky City? It was impossible. Um, I mean, impossible for a long time. It still is impossible. Um and somebody, there was a film crew in town, and they were making a documentary called Philly's Not Dead. And they asked me a couple questions. And it, it really is tough for bands from the city. It, again, if you're not from New York or L.A. Or one of the, one of the towns that is musically hip, like, you know, for like, they have these little spontaneous moments, and they're hip for a couple of weeks, and they're gone. So, like Seattle or Austin or Portland. Um, so if you're not from one of those areas yet, it's, it's darn near impossible to get noticed. So, but again, that's totally fine with me. I prefer... You know, bands from like the weird sort of backwaters of America. I think they're they're much more interesting. And um, you know, I, I don't want to hear a band that made it in a town where it was easy to make it. You know, a lot of very boring bands from towns where it's easy to get noticed. So yeah, it was, um, you know, we we toured back and forth across the United States and lost a lot of money. And uh, um, yeah, it's um, you know, it is. If you're from Philly, again, it's impossible to get noticed. But is that such a bad thing? With me is Rodney Anonymous on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Straight ahead, we'll talk more about the history of the Dead Milkman and we'll play their latest track. Instant club hit, you'll dance to anything. The Dead Milkman, the group's frontman Rodney Anonymous, is with me now on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Rodney, Bitchin' Camaro was your breakthrough hit. We played that to lead off our interview. It featured a very cool improv in the beginning and just some hard fun stuff at the end. Yeah, the... um. Now, again, we didn't plan it that way. We were in rehearsal one day in our drummer's basement, and, you know, we were just playing that. Doom, doom, doom. You know, Dave was just doing that, and I just started speaking over it. And all, what I'm saying is almost verbatim. I had been in line behind uh, two people at a convenience store, and they, they had the stuff I'm saying about going to the shore, being 26 and still going to the shore, is pretty much what they said. It was so insane, and it was something that I had heard so many people say the same sort of thing my whole life. I just thought I had a bag with me, you know, with a bean and cheese burrito in it. And I thought, oh, take the pen out and write on the bag, like, what they're saying. And I, I still do this today. I carry on my smartphone. People see me take it out, and I'll begin to, to like, you know, punch in, like, when I hear people saying odd things. I'm absolutely fascinated. Like, most of our songs, 
just come from crazy things that people have said to me. So I, I recited back what was on the, on the burrito bag, and the guys played that, and then they had the other song, and they just kind of, you know, the other fast beat, so we melded them together. Well, college stations continued to play your albums, Rodney, as the Dead Milkmen moved forward. Tracks like Instant Club Hit and The Thing That Only Eats Hippies made you celebrities on the alternative rock and punk circuits. But again, it's like you guys really just didn't take yourselves all that seriously, even though you got more popular. We shouldn't. And college radio stations shouldn't play us now. You know, we, we're, we're gone. Go out, I'm going to show college radio stations, go out and play somebody new. You know, and kind of give them a list. I say, you know, play some Angel Spit. You know, play some, play some um, Assembly 23. I would shake the hell out of these people. And go, if you want to play us somewhere in there, that's fine. I, I do it you know, on my radio show. I play a bunch of new stuff, and I like to throw in, there's a lot of old bands that I like. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm puzzled by why college, well, college radio does a lot of horrible things now. But um, if anyone's listening from college radio, please stop playing, stop going to the alternative bin. That music is not alternative, all right? There's nothing alternative about it. So go go elsewhere and find stuff. Well, today's alternative is mainly mainstream alternative. Back in the 80s, it was real alternative. The definition was music that wasn't played on the commercial stations. Yeah, you know, that's right. It's, it's odd. People don't, won't believe this when you tell them, but there was a time when the B-52s were considered like a dangerous band. You know, radio stations considered the B-52s a dangerous punk band. Wouldn't plan, they wouldn't play the Talking Head. Um, they, the Ramones, they wouldn't go near the Ramones with a 10-foot stick. That's odd when you turn on TV now and you see people talking about, and rightfully so, talking about how great the Ramones were. And, you know, and, and then they're like, everybody loved them. And I'm thinking, this is such a revisionist history. You know, they would not play them on the radio. They just, in fact, the Ramones wrote songs about not getting played on the radio. I just think it was one of the things the Ramones did right was not getting played on the radio. It turned out in the long run to, you know, be better for them. Well, that's true, but that sort of gave them some cred, which is what you guys had in many other of the punk bands. And still, some did break in to get radio airplay, and maybe had a hit or two, but still kept their uh, their punk roots. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of weird. I think it's a, a minority. I certainly think we lost all of our cred. We did a lot of stupid things. Um, you know, we, I, my problem is, I was, uh, I'm not good at saying, I was not good in the past at saying no. Uh, so our manager would say, hey, I've got an idea. And I would say no, but not loud enough. So I would, you know, go to things and there would be, um, you know, like, I, I'm still angry about the cow at the, uh, uh, thing. I want to be much more hardcore and angry, I think, than, than, you know, the people around me wanted me to be. I'm lost on my punk cred, but I have some gone industrial cred I can still trade on. That's a good point. We'll get into that in a yeah. few moments because I was thinking you could get that punk cred back by doing a cover of Dr. Martin's Boots from Radical Posture. We, we did that, actually. We, did Dr. We, we played at Dr. Martin's store, basically in your free shoes, and we covered Dr. Martin's Boots. We really did do that. I'm not, not lying. <laughs> that... I know all the words to it, except the price has gone up. So in the original, they're like, these are 20, you know, these retail for, you know, 29, you know, pounds and 24p. And I picked up a pair and they retail for like about 200 bucks. But I will say, I own a pair and they're the most comfortable shoes in the world. I'm not selling them. I'm just saying that uh, it's in my will that I'm, that I'm to be cremated in my Doc Martin. Like you were saying off the air, you do that today, yeah. a lot of the kids won't even know what you're doing. No, they have no idea. I think, again, it's, you know, I, I don't, but I, I try to, um, I don't want to be like out of touch with like what the current joke is. So I don't want to be like the old guy. I don't get that. So I, you know, yeah. So uh, I'm willing to let the young ones go in order to like laugh at something from, you know, to get a joke from, it's not even a great show. That is a classic. In fact, it's much funnier than Portlandia. Yeah, you got that 100% right. Maybe a mix, a little bit of young ones thrown in is always pretty good. After the Dead Milkmen broke up, and this is what you were talking about before your goth cred, you worked with another band, Burn Witch Burned, with your wife, Fianna. Yeah, that was an idea I had. I don't understand why this wasn't a big moneymaker. Um, and we, we sort of, we, I think we stumbled upon steampunk before anybody else really knew what it was called. or you know. So I was in a sort of proto-steampunk band, and I really enjoyed that. And at that time, there were bands like Rasputino or the Dresden who were doing very different stuff with very different instruments, and that's where we tried to go with that. And, and uh, I don't know if it would have gone on. My wife has, um, she sings beautifully and plays violin, uh, but she never told me until we had the band for a while that she suffers from stage fright, and so she couldn't actually 
um, go forward with the band. So I was like, oh, well, I could remarry or I could just end the band. So I decided to end that band. You could always just stay in studio like XTC. Well, this was, again, my mouth is full of stuff here. <laughs> this was um, before the sort of cheap home studios. Like now, the studio I have in my home would have cost millions of dollars to build in the 80s or 90s. And, you know, I just, oh, hey, this is, you know, cost me a couple grand, max. Oh, I said it's just cheaper. A lot of the stuff I own is stolen. I am a terrible kleptomaniac. This is true. I will steal anything that isn't nailed down. So, yeah, it is cheaper for a band in town that to, to, they, they have a, a, a Kickstarter thing going so they can get a touring van. Uh, they're called My Parasites. And I saw a, a police van sitting unattended. I thought, that would be the best gift for them if I could just steal a police van. So, yeah, my, my wife has to watch out for me. I will actually, I will, anything that isn't nailed down, I will take. So let's get this straight, Rodney. You would steal anything, and your blog is called Rodney Anonymous Tells Us How to Live. Yes, Rodney, yeah, Rodney Anonymous Tells You How to Live. I think, I'm, I think I'm more qualified than most people to tell people how to live. Uh, in fact, that's what every blog is. Every blog is somebody telling you how to live. Every, if you turn on any talk show like Oprah, is Oprah telling you how to live. I just don't beat around in the bush. I say this and how to live. I should write a, you know, like a manual for life. And say, you know, chapter one, you know, this is what, what to believe. Chapter two, this is how to act. I, I think that would probably be very helpful. I should get around to that one day. You also have a radio show that goes along with that. Yeah, the radio show sort of the thing right now. I, I, I do a lot of odd things. I, I do a lot of writing and have the band. And I should work a regular job. But the radio show, uh, I really, well, you do a radio show. You know what I'm talking about. It's the thing I really kind of enjoy doing uh, probably the most. Uh, it gave me free reign to play whatever I want. So uh, once a month for two hours, I just go on and play you know, whatever the hell I want, and it's completely different from the station's regular uh, music that they play, and they're really cool about it and really support it. You know, I said, well, what kind of songs? And I'm like, well, how about, like, Fosgore's 20 Ways to Kill Someone? And they thought I was making that song up. I'm like, no, no, it's a real song. It's really good. So, yeah, the first show, I think, scared the hell out of them, but they were, they were nice enough to stay on board. I think I have a listener. I think there is one person that totally listens to that show. After that, if that person gets sick or decides they can't listen that week, I'm in deep trouble. We'll make it three or four after this show. How about that? There might be three or four, yeah. There we go. All of Philadelphia you know, is constructed around the idea you shouldn't be able to hear the music I'm playing on the air. That is totally how it works here. It's a very strange, as you pointed out before, it's a very strange city. Rodney, I want to talk about the band's new music, but let's take it back a little while, because after your band broke up, went your separate ways, did some very interesting mm -hmm. projects. Uh, one of your guys, your bandmate David Schultes, became very active in rebuilding Serbia. Yeah, he rebuilt most of it himself, yeah. Well, he did try to help out, definitely. And yeah, no, he did. I'm not being, I'm not being a wise-ass for the first time ever. No, he was, he was a, he, again, a very fascinating person, um, a uh, degree in economics, uh, Eastern European economics. Um, went, we went over to what was Yugoslavia. It was then falling apart and becoming a different country. I hated it there. And he actually looked around and went, yeah, this place has opportunity. Yeah, he was over there at one point when uh, he, the U.N. had dropped bombs on a uh, bomb shelter he was in at one point. The U.N. forces. So, yeah, he, he, got, he got bombed in Serbia. That's true. And uh, it was an incredibly noble life's mission. It doesn't seem weird if you knew him. Like, anybody else, they go, well, you know, where, where is he? Go, oh, he's over in Serbia right now, you know. And they go, that's kind of odd. Not with Dave. That's sort of where you expected him to be. Yeah, and unfortunately, he uh, committed suicide back in 2004. That must have been uh, pretty rough news for you guys. It was rough news, but we tell people now he faked his death and he lives in Serbia. That's really what we do. Oh, because oh, when you really, it's almost... Some people think I'm absolutely a horrible person for saying this or something. If you didn't know him, there's no way that you can be sad when people talk about him. Uh, you know, well, if you know, if you did, if you knew him, you can't, you couldn't be sad. So because he was just so funny and everything, it was just so hilarious and, and just a funny person that when we had his funeral, people were just cracking up about the stuff he used to do. So we decided that this is Serbia now. It's got like two wives and a bunch of kids, and that's pretty much what we tell people. And it's, it's, we get the best looks ever, and it would totally serve him. He'd, he'd be totally happy because you know, he, all he did all day long was just play pranks on people and mess with them. And he, he was a great person for that. He was, he, his whole life had been a fight against boredom. 
And, uh, you know, the worst thing could happen is he would get bored. But then he would do things like set trash cans on fire or uh, you could have him near a telephone on tour because he would instantly begin crank calling people out of the phone book. And, you know, so it was a lot of fun. So people were, like, always expect me to be sad when I talk about him. And all I could think, I, I really wish the guy hadn't faked his own death and moved to Serbia because I'd love to have him around now because I, I probably only got, you know, about 10% of how brilliant he was when I knew him. And as the years have gone by, I'm like, man, that guy was really, had his act together. He was, you know, I feel sorry for, for a lot of stuff I did do it. Uh, like, call, like, one time um, the cops came to my hotel room, and David just woke it up and wandered down there. So I pointed him out as the troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it was, oh, look, it was him. You know, I'm, okay, I'm really afraid of that guy. If we just get him out of there. So, you know, yeah, that was a good night. That was, uh, Oh, poor Dave. Dave. Dave put up with a lot, yeah. <laughs> he was okay with it. He was really bizarre. He um he had like a sleep sort of like a sleep apnea problem. So he uh, um what program was he for? So what happened was he would uh, um he would wake up hours after he got out of bed. In other words, he wouldn't quite be awake. So for you know, if you woke him up around eight until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, you can have great fun with the guy. <laughs> he was kind of out of it. It was almost like, like you know, a zombie. So you sort of walk him around and go, hey, Dave, go do this. And he would. Or if somebody had shown up at the house because they were mad at us for making noise or for, you know, altering something, um, then, you know, we would just say, oh, you, this is the guy you want to talk to. And he was barely awake. He was a lot of fun. Rodney Anonymous is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Straight ahead, we're going to talk about the new music. The Dead Milkman, the thing that only eats hippies on Revenge of the 80s Radio. With me is Rodney Anonymous. Rodney, the Dead Milkmen are back together now, and you released a new album last year, and you're putting out some new singles. Yeah, I, I never, I don't understand, like, I'm like the most anti-vinyl person in the world, so the fact that I was willing to, to do singles just shows, like, how much I, I get along with the rest of the band. And they can go, oh, please, I'm like, oh, okay. Generally, I'm, I'm really anti-vinyl. If I go over to his house and I have it, I, I break it. Well, maybe you just didn't say no loud enough again. Yeah, I did. I didn't. I'm not saying no loud. Although it's worked out. I like the singles. I have them. They're, they're super cool. My wife gets... The, uh, the ones of Ronald Reagan killed the black guy will make my wife laugh at like 100 yards. So, And I also, yeah, I've worked with some other people's singles. So I'm not so much anti-single anymore. And they come with little download cards and everything. So you can get the digital version. I got a whole bunch of them right here. I'm looking at right now, as a matter of fact. Well, I like showing vinyl to the kids when they come in and do radio station tours. They look at me like I have two heads. Although one smart alecky tiger cub once said yeah, that's one of the things they used to use in the olden days. It's weird because a lot of young people are, are really into vinyl now. It's like that's all they have. I mean, there's a hipster store in town, a uh, record store. There's a really good record store I go to uh, called Digital Ferret. It's a great record store. But there's a horrible hipster record store I won't say the name of. And I went there, and the guy before me had asked for some record, and the woman goes to get the vinyl, and, and he's like, no, no, it's a CD. It's just most of our customers prefer vinyl. I'm like, oh, oh, lady, you're going to pay when I get up there. So, yeah, so I gave her a real hard time <laughs> for being a hipster. <laughs> Rodney, your new single is The Great Boston Molasses Flood. There was a big molasses flood in Boston, which people don't believe, but it really happened. In 1919, they used to... Uh, use molasses for a whole lot of sweetening things, and, and actually, it's surprising it happened as late as it did. And they had they held these huge tanks in Boston, and then one day, one of the tanks ruptured, something I believe about 250 million gallons of, of unprocessed molasses <laughs> into the street, and a tidal wave. So it was a tidal wave about 30 feet high of molasses. I'm just surprised that nobody's written a song about that because it's, when you hear it, it just sticks in your head. And I really like Boston. Boston's a, a city that. Um, I started spending a lot of time there when I was young, so I, I've always been kind of fascinated by it and wanted to write something about it. And uh, I always had this, uh, there was a magazine, a fanzine, back, you know, talk about something young people don't know about, don't know about fanzines, called Murder Can Be Fun. And Murder Can Be Fun had an entire I Love Disasters issue, and the guy just, he, he loved disasters. And um, it, that was one of the things they mentioned, and it was the Great Boston Molasses Flood. So for, I'd say, about 25 years, I've wanted to write a song about that. I wonder how many people got stuck in that thing. Uh, I think it killed, I believe it killed at least 50, but for the longest time afterwards, Boston was all covered in the sticky goo, and for years in that neighborhood, I'm, I'm talking, this happened in 1919, and well into the late 1940s, when it would get hot out, 
you could smell the molasses because it seeped into the you know the cracks in the sidewalk down into the streets, and it would just it would just ooze molasses for years. Again, this is this is fascinating stuff. I was just saying, if I have my choice of ways to die, I think molasses flood is a pretty good one. You know, that's something memorable. And people at your funeral will be trying not to laugh. They've been <laughs> molasses flood. So, yeah, so I, I think it's, if it, as far as ways to go, I'd rather, you know, die that way than have, like, a piano fall out the window on me. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And at the funeral, you'll smell pretty good, too. Yeah, that's true. They could, yeah, they don't even need to really bury you. They just smear you on some toast or something. Yeah, I, I could see during one of those molasses floods, people coming out of their apartments with a big jar and a, and a ladle. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the stuff. thing that they never talk about, you know, because molasses back then, everybody used it for everything. It was the all-purpose sweetener, and they would refine it to get, like, this, you know, um, industrial alcohol. So it was like money pouring into the street. So I'm pretty sure that for the longest time after that, when you bought molasses, you probably had to pick, you know, bits of gravel and stuff out of it. Yeah, I feel bad for the horses that were killed. In the Great Wall, I don't care about the people, but I've always felt bad for the horses that were killed in the Great Boston, Boston molasses flood. That's because they have no idea what's coming. They don't understand no, the concept of molasses. That's a, that's a horse's worst nightmare. You know what I mean? Because you got the blinders on, you're pulling around a trolley, and then you, know, you, don't, you don't even hear it coming. All you know is that you are suddenly covered in this goo, and, and your horse life is over. And you can't even find those salt licks around anywhere. Rodney, the Great Boston Molasses Flood is your latest single. Anything else the Dead Milkman has coming down the pike? Yeah, we've got a song called Welcome to Undertown. I'm only mentioning it. I never mention what we're doing. I Usually I wind up talking more about other people's bands and what they're doing. But they usually fascinate me a lot more. But this is, and, and you know how like, people go, it's like an African child in the movie, um, oh, Get Him to the Greek, where the guy just wants to talk about a new song. They want to hear African Child. I would not be mentioning this song, but Joe wrote it. It's like my favorite Dead Milkman song. So in a couple months when Welcome to Undertown comes out, you go, oh, he was right. That is a really good song. So, yeah, we have, and then that's beside it with the um, uh, song While I Was Walking to Work, which Dan Drew, our bass player, uh, wrote the music for. And then we also have another one, because we do three-sided records, and the third side is uh, called The Sun Turns Our Patio Into a Lifeless Hell. The sun can do that, huh? Yeah, well, no, I was up one night and I couldn't sleep. And I saw this ad for this awning. And I don't know if you've seen this or not. It's, it's the sun, I think it's the Sundowner awning. It is the most tragic thing on TV. It's this entire family becomes social outcasts because they can't use their patio. <laughs> it needs to be seen. It is high drama. It is like it like a Harold, a Harold Pinter play, and it's that good. You have some live shows coming up, too, including one in New York. Yes, I believe so. No, I, I can't tell you where in New York, and everybody else knows. I'd have to go to the Milkman page, and I was terrible about them. I, I never know. I know we're playing. Oh, we're playing the Bowery Ballroom. See, thank God for the, the or thank Charles Nelson Riley for the Milkman page, because I would be completely lost without it. And yes, it says here the Bowery Ballroom in New York City. See, to me, that's weird, because I think of the Bowery, I think, you know, back to the 70s, when the Bowery was, a, I guess, a much different place than it is now. Yeah, you miss old New York. I miss old New York from like the um, like the New York when you watch Midnight Cowboy and that scary, dangerous New York. They need to bring that back. I don't need a New York with the Lion King in Times Square. Right? I need I need the old porno ish Times Square that you were afraid to sit down there. The, the Times Square from my youth needs to be brought back. Right now in New York, the mayor wants you to not have large sodas, smoke too much, or well, basically do things he doesn't like. I'm totally with that. I totally, I'm totally with that. There's nothing more obnoxious than, than being in the 7-Eleven behind a kid with a big gulp. Uh, you know, the smoking, uh, I know that there's really no, that a lot of people will this, but there's no health effect from smoke, secondhand smoke, but smoking has lost all of its cool. It's, it used to be, when you saw like Nick and Nora, like the thin man, like everybody was sophisticated smoking. I was just quit smoking a while ago, basically because smoking became the product of redneck. It's not fun anymore. Because the people on Honey Boo Boo smoke. And if you can deny anybody a thrill, I say if you deny the people on Boo Boo their large sodas and their smokes, they might go out and read something. Maybe it's time to switch to the Chowin tobacco. Chowin, yeah. <laughs> I was, there was um, a big protest here um, in Philadelphia. Uh, and, um, I, it was uh, um, an anti health care thing. But there's a woman carrying a sign that said, like, you know, get rid of them the czars. And czars had a hammer and sickle spelling the C. And we were forming the C. And I explained to her, I said, well, you do know that the, um, you know, the czar, the communists got rid of the czar. And I explained to her, you know, 
basically 300 years of Russian history. And she's like, oh, that is fascinating. I goes, well, I'm still here because these new rules won't let my, my son, you know, I wish he could be here, but he's in school. He eat Charles. And I hadn't heard what Charlie was. But yeah, her son was 12 years old and shoot tobacco. What a charming <laughs> individual. They bust her in from outside the city. I should point that out, too. Dick Army's organization paid to bust this woman into my city to hold up a, a historically incorrect sign and talk about her 12-year-old son who chaws. That's some scary See, Why isn't that a song? I, I should turn that into a song, damn it. Now that's a cunning plan. Yeah. Rodney Anonymous, thank you for coming on Revenge of the 80s Radio well, with us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. We'd love to hear from more of your cunning plans and great music. You can find out what the Dead Milkmen have been up to on their website, www.deadmilkmen.com. Let's play your newest single, Rodney, The Great Boston Molasses Flood, from the Dead Milkmen on Revenge of the 80s Radio.